All right, everyone, now we're gonna do the second half of the 10-1 lecture covering the leg and the popliteal fossa. Popliteal fossa being the uh, posterior portion of the knee joint. We left off with this slide talking about uh, the uh, arterial vascular supply uh, of the popliteal fossa of the knee joint and going into the leg. Now note the uh, tibial artery branches into an anterior and posterior tibial artery here with the fibular artery branching off of posterior uh, tibial artery. Uh, the branching pattern of the nerves of the leg is different. Uh, so note that difference. Here we can see uh, the branching pattern of the sciatic nerve where it branches in the posterior thigh into the tibial and common fibular nerve. Now the, uh, the nerves the tibial nerve continues into the posterior leg and supplies the posterior compartment of the leg, whereas the common fibular nerve will branch again at the head of the fibula. Uh, that branching at the head of the fibula will form a deep fibular nerve and a superficial fibular nerve. Deep fibular nerve is going to travel through uh, the connected tissue that separates the anterior and lateral compartments of the leg. So it's traveling deep through that, um, that connective tissue and supplies the anterior compartment of the leg. The superficial fibular nerve doesn't travel deep through that structure, stays superficial, stays lateral, and supplies the lateral compartment of the leg. So pay attention to the difference in the naming structures of the uh, neural branching versus the vascular branching. Don't get those confused. And of course, now everyone will. Uh, so let's move on and talk about the compartments of the leg. There's an anterior compartment, a posterior compartment, which I'm gonna further subdivide into deep and superficial and a lateral compartment. These are all encased by the deep connective tissue, which changes its name from the fascia lata of the thigh and now is named the uh, crural fascia in the leg. <clears throat> uh, so moving on, we can talk about and name the different muscles in all of these compartments. The anterior compartment is going to mainly facilitate dorsiflexion of the foot, uh, as well as um, you know uh, toe extension. Uh, these actions are innervated; these muscles are innervated by the deep fibular nerve, as I just said. But make note of the exceptions. So um, we're going to have inversion and eversion of the foot from different muscles in the anterior compartment. So because the anterior compartment uh, causes dorsiflexion of the foot, uh, that means that damage to that nerve that supplies the anterior compartment, the deep fibular nerve, or also called deep peroneal nerve, uh, is going to cause a condition called drop foot, where a patient cannot dorsiflex their foot. So as they're walking, their foot is going to become flaccid and cause tripping. So this is a pathological condition. It can be corrected with braces uh, within the shoe, uh, strapped to the leg, which cause, uh, which allow the foot to maintain a, a uh, horizontal plane as the person picks the foot up. Uh, so um, this nerve is commonly damaged. It can be damaged because it's traveling uh, superficial to the neck of the fibula, superficial just around the head of the fibula, which is on the lateral side of the body, uh, lateral side of the knee. And that lateral side of the knee is subject to a lot of forces uh, that can uh, impact it, especially in sports or other activities. <clears throat> so there's a... Um, a very famous case back in the early 90s uh, of the Olympic figure skater uh, Nancy Kerrigan. Uh, so Nancy Kerrigan was of course attacked and bludgeoned uh, in her knee, uh, in her knee joint by her rival's ex-husband 
Um, so uh, Tanya Harding being the rival. And so uh, these hitmen uh, came in with the intention of ruining Nancy Kerrigan's career, making sure she could never beat her rival. Uh, and so they uh, attacked her and bludgeoned her knee. And because these hitmen didn't know their anatomy, they bludgeoned her in the front of her knee, in her kneecap, in her patellar ligament. Uh, so they did this just seven short weeks before the Olympic ice skating tournament in which uh, uh, Nancy Kerrigan was scheduled to compete for the gold medal. And so, of course, the horror, uh, you know, that she wouldn't be able to compete, but uh, through intensive rehabilitation and training, and because of the ignorance of her attackers, in seven uh, short weeks, she remarkably recovered and went on to win the silver medal in the Winter Olympics of 1994. Had her attackers known anatomy, they would have known not to attack on the front of the knee, but on the side of the knee. Had they hit her in the side of the knee, they would have damaged the deep peroneal nerve and she would never have been able to walk correctly again. So my point isn't to be controversial. My point is just to, you know, uh, make a statement that's going to help you remember this information. But the point is here that the deep peroneal nerve, the deep fibular nerve, is in a uh, very uh, precarious and uh, location prone to damage. Uh, and that results in this pathological condition of drop foot. <clears throat> the, uh, the other point is if you ever need a hitman, make sure they know their anatomy. No, just kidding. Don't hire hitmen. Uh, so moving on from the anterior compartment of the leg to the lateral compartment of the leg. The lateral compartment, as I said, is innervated by the superficial fibular nerve. So I've already introduced some confusing terminology here, fibular versus peroneal. Those two terms are, they mean the same thing. They are interchangeable. They both mean the same thing. Uh, fibula is uh, Latin. Uh, Perone is Greek. They both refer to the clasp-like structure of the fibula uh, next to the tibia. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, we've got a few uh, muscles here in the lateral compartment that, as you would guess, evert the foot. They also plantar flex the foot. Moving on to the posterior compartment. In the superficial uh, portion of the posterior compartment, we have the triceps surae muscles, which is gastrocnemius and soleus deep to it. Those attach to uh, the back of the, uh, to the uh, calcaneal tu uh, tuberosity of the foot, causing plantar flexion at the ankle. Uh, they will, because the gastrocnemius muscles also attach above the knee joint, they will also facilitate knee flexion. Uh, soleus does not. Soleus attaches to the head of the uh, fibula and to the posterior portion of the tib uh, tibia and uh, just facilitate plantar flexion of the foot. Plantaris uh, really, you know, it attaches to the same place, originates in the same location as gastrocnemius, but it is such a small muscle. Its action is really negligible, but it would uh, facilitate and contribute to plantar flexion as well as some knee flexion. Uh, so depending on your textbook, it may uh, mention those actions. But these are innervated by tibial nerve, which is running in the posterior compartment. <clears throat> as we head deep into the deep posterior compartment, we see uh, uh, more of these uh, plantar flexors as well as uh, muscles that are going to cause inversion of the foot, rotation toward the midline uh, of the foot. Uh, so these are again uh, innervated by the tibial nerve. The reason they cause this inversion is because these muscle tendons travel behind the medial malleolus uh, to attach to the medial portion of the foot. Uh, so uh, in that way they're causing as well as plantar flexion, also inversion. 
an important muscle in the posterior compartment, uh, important for uh, walking and movement and stabilization of the knee, is the popliteus muscle. So when we fully extend our knee, our femur rotates down onto the tibial plateau and secures itself within the menisci of the tibial plateau. So in this way, that facilitates an effortless, upright, bipedal posture. We don't have to continually contract our muscles uh, to make sure our knee is fully extended. We don't, we're not constantly using our uh, quads in our thigh to keep our upright posture. So in order to begin the walking cycle and to unlock the knee, we have to contract popliteus muscle. Popliteus muscle here attached uh, to the medial portion of the tibia is going to cause an internal rotation of the tibia underneath the femur. And that internal rotation of the tibia will uh, separate the femur from the tibial plateau and allow more mobility within the knee joint. So that's a popliteus, an important muscle in the posterior compartment of the leg to facilitate uh, movement. So here I already mentioned the course of these posterior compartment tendons, uh, muscle tendons, as they travel uh, posterior uh, to the medial malleolus of the tibia. Uh, so these tendons and the neurovasculature, the, the tibial nerve as well as the posterior tibial artery and vein uh, are going to travel with these muscle tendons into the plantar side of the foot, traveling deep to the flexor retinaculum of the ankle. And so uh, there is a mnemonic to memorize the order from anterior to posterior in which we see uh, these tendons and arteries, veins, and nerves. And the mnemonic is Tom Dick and Very Nervous Harry. And that mnemonic stands for Tib Posterior Flexor Digitorum Longus, Posterior Tibial Artery, Posterior Tibial Vein, Tibial Nerve, and finally Flexor Hallucis Longus. So that's Tom Dick and Very Nervous Harry, as you can see emphasized on the slide, those names and uh, the acronyms. So, of course, when we talk about the leg, we want to uh, know about some, some of the pathologies of the leg. And one of these is uh, commonly referred to as shin splints. This is also known as compartment syndrome. So, the, uh, the crural fascia, the deep investing fascia that separates the compartments, the muscular compartments of the leg, also prevent fluid movement between these compartments. Uh, as the muscles contract, of course, they're building up lactic acid and uh, calcium in the interstitial space, uh, and that buildup can increase the pressure within the compartment. Uh, so this increased intracompartmental pressure is called compartment syndrome and can lead to that painful burning sensation of the leg. Shin splints uh, can also refer to the pain caused from the shearing or the pulling of the, um, the, the, the breakage of this connective tissue uh, away from uh, you know, the, the different compartments and their attachments, the ligamentous, the tendinous attachments, and the uh, uh, interosteal uh, uh, ligament between the tibia and the fibula. So uh, most common in the anterior compartment uh, because, of course, as we're uh, moving, we need to dorsiflex that foot, uh, but can also happen in the posterior compartment uh, because that running, as we push, as we, dors or as we plant our flex, our foot to push off from the ground, that's causing a buildup uh, of activity in the posterior compartment. The posterior compartment is much larger, so it, it uh, is not as prone to damage as the anterior compartment, which is much smaller. Uh, so typically shin splints occur in that anterior compartment. Now let's talk about the popliteal fossa. We can see here the popliteal fossa is this diamond-shaped region. It has these different boundaries, the uh, biceps femoris, semimembranosus, uh, and the heads of gastrocnemius. So those are the boundaries that form 
the popliteal fossa, uh, as you can see there. The popliteal fossa contains a number of important structures. The uh, branches of sciatic nerve travel through the popliteal fossa, as well as the popliteal artery and vein, and the associated lymph nodes in that region. <clears throat> so an infection of the lower leg uh, may indeed travel into the lymph nodes of the popliteal fossa where they could be palpated. Uh, so here we can see a more anatomical view, including the neurovasculature, of the different regions. It's important to note here where the center of the joint capsule of the knee is. The popliteal fossa does not center on the knee joint. The knee joint is actually at the inferior portion of the popliteal fossa. Recall that gastrocnemius heads attach above the knee joint. So for that reason, the knee joint's down here. Uh, this has consequences for how you identify things when you're looking at the actual uh, tissue. Uh, so we will see branches of popliteal artery in the middle of the popliteal fossa. Those branches are actually the superior genicular branches above the knee joint. To find the inferior genicular branches, we will actually have to look deep to gastrocnemius and deep to soleus muscles, uh, potentially, uh, to find those inferior genicular branches. Typically, uh, the inferior genicular branches travel uh, above the soleus muscle, which is attaching to the head of the fibula, uh, but it will have branches throughout that region. So just an important note there. Here we can see uh, where popliteal fossa is in relation to the vasculature that I already showed you, and we can see uh, these different important branches. Another important condition related to the knee joint are called Baker's cysts. So, of course, the knee joint is a synovial joint with a synovial cavity within it, but the knee joint sustains a lot of pressure in daily activities, especially in runners and athletes. What can happen is a weakening in the joint capsule of that uh, synovial cavity can cause uh, a, a, um, a cystic uh, outpressuring of that synovial fluid, causing a little pocket outside the joint capsule, a little synovial pocket uh, called a, a Baker's cyst. Uh, so kind of similar to the bursa uh, that we see in other joint cavities that help facilitate uh, and cushion the muscular movements around joints. But these Baker's cysts, as you can see in this small image here, are actually an outgrowth of that synovial cavity. And these can be visualized uh, on the popliteal fossa so we can compare here the normal knee joint versus this bulging portion in the popliteal fossa. Uh, so that is the indication of a Baker's cyst. Here in this individual, we can see a large Baker's cyst encompassing most of the popliteal fossa. So as these grow, they can begin to impair the neurovasculature in the region as well. So uh, just a little caveat there. So that's all I have for this lecture. Thanks for listening. Uh, I will see you next time.